Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast, where we seek to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now, before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow, or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now, here's what we've got for you today. Today on the podcast, I'm speaking with John Hartley. John is the executive director at the World Firefighter Games. Now, the world of firefighter games, firefighter challenges, firefighter events is ever expanding. But the World Firefighter Games is not a new thing. It has been around since way back in 1990. It was their very first one at Auckland in New Zealand. They had over 1,800 athletes in 17 countries compete in 34 different events. Now, this is different to many of the challenges that people in the UK will perhaps be familiar with, and it's very much more an Olympic-style model. It's an international sporting event that welcomes full-time, part-time, and volunteer firefighters, ambush firefighters, aviation, military, and anyone and their direct families involved in the fire and rescue service. Now, the games happen biannually, that means every other year, uh, in different countries, and they offer more than 50 different sporting events and challenges, including some of the staple stuff you will recognize, archery, rugby, windsurfing, poker, swimming, athletics, softball, and the toughest firefighter alive, and some of those blue ribbon events that we're all familiar with. Purpose of the Games was put together with four real key concepts behind it. Promoting health and fitness amongst our first responders. Uh, providing a forum for information exchange between fire services. It's a fantastic networking event, stuff like this. They foster comradeship amongst firefighters and they encourage family participation. As you hear in my conversation with John today, if your children are over 18 years of age, they can also come and participate in the Firefighter Games. So we are putting this one out early. We've leapfrogged it ahead of a bunch of different episodes because you need to get in there if you want to be at the World Firefighter Games 2024. It's in Olberg, Denmark this year and it's held September 7th to the 14th. We will put a link in the notes for the podcast so you can go over to their website and you can register there. You can look at travel, you can look at tourist attractions, you can look at the events, you can look at the program. All the information is over there, so please do have a look in the notes for this episode. And again, as you're looking into the rest of the year, if you're setting those challenges for yourself, maybe you're doing the British this year, maybe you're doing an ultra marathon that we've spoken about on the podcast, maybe you're doing high rocks, maybe you're doing something else. But if you are looking for something spicy, that you want to go and have an incredible event, you want to go meet firefighters from across the world, you want to go as part of a team, maybe you're... UK rugby team, maybe your badminton team, maybe whatever, you are going to go over there. Maybe tabs, you at your local station, you are just incredible at table tennis and you want to head over to the World Firefighter Games, spend a couple of days there, have an absolute scream, have some good drinks, have some good food, meet some incredible people, your brothers and sisters from all over the world. Then the Firefighter Games is absolutely something you need to be going and having a look at. So have a look at the notes and get the link from there. You can go on and contact with John's team. And I've also put a link in there for John Hartley's LinkedIn account if you need to access and you wanna make contact with him specifically as well. So without further ado, let's get in there with today's guest, John Hartley, Executive Director at the World Firefighter Games. I'll see you on the other side. John, good morning, sir. Good morning, Pete, how are you? Well, afternoon. I'm wonderful, my good man. How the hell are you? Oh, well, the sea breeze has finally come in, so it's down to about 33 degrees now. <laughs> where are you? Uh, where are we finding you? In which place of the world are you today? Western, well, Rockingham, Western Australia. How long have you been out there for now? What are we? Uh, 53 years. Wow. Okay, so you've lived out in Australia 53 years. Where did you start your career then? Me, at, uh, I was on, a, on a, an alumina refinery as okay. an emergency response team. How long did you spend in that work? Uh, 26 years before my back gave up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress, and we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. 
Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative, waterproof, breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide. Gore-Tex, going further together. When did you first have your first interactions with Firefighter Games and Challenges? Uh, the games were held in Perth in 1994, and we received an invite from the uh, World Firefighter Games to compete through our refinery, put a team in for the World 1994 World Firefighter Games, which were held here in Perth. So that was very early on, it, wasn't it? Because it started in 88, did it start? Nine, well, the first games was in 1990. Roger that. Right, yeah, first ones in New Zealand, weren't they? Yep, yep, New Zealand, then, then Las Vegas, then, and then Perth. God, I bet Las Vegas was uh, was pretty uh, was pretty incredible. So ninety four, you first got involved in this. Yeah. Why did Why did the World Firefighter Games get started? Because this is probably an important distinction that you could probably help some of our listeners with. Well, what's the difference between this and the other challenges and the police and World Firefighter Games and 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 there's there's lots of different variations of things out there. I think the World Firefighter Games initially they were started by an American, a gentleman by the name of Bill Gray, who I think saw the World Police and Fire Games and thought he could develop something along the, the, the same lines, but mm-hmm. just honing in on the fire service. So he initiated the games. Uh, Auckland were the first ones to pick up the inaugural games. Hmm. And from there, it went to Las Vegas. And then the West Australian firefighters did a lot of fundraising to get their team there, both Auckland hmm. and Las Vegas. And this, the Bill, Bill Gray wanted sort of out. He'd had enough after two games. Hmm. So the West Australian firefighters formed West World Firefighter Games WA Inc. And then they, they bought him out. for How much? I don't know. I remember reading, and I don't know if this was bullshit or like you'll have to help us connect the dots here, but the World Police and Fire Games was only available to full-time paid firefighters. Yep. I think that, so that was a bit of a, um, I want to say elitist maybe a little bit, yeah. but like I, I, a, lot of, a lot of nations across the world, yeah. a large percentage of our fire and rescue service are volleys, aren't they? Volunteers. Yeah, yeah. and that, that was it. That was the elitist bit, whereas, <coughs> excuse me, the World Police and the World Firefighting Games involved everyone that's involved with the fire service you know from the the guy who's got his hand on the branch to the guy or the lady who's at the back typing out bulletins for the fire service whatever that full spectrum and then they yeah also volunteers and retired firefighters Mm. Because there is almost a hypocrisy to it when we talk about the firefighting family, but then if we only extend that to full-time operational firefighters, that's that just like screams the two-tier system, like, you know, backroom staff aren't yeah. as good as anybody else, yeah. and they're not really part of the fire service and all that and sort of And volunteers aren't part which, of the um, fire service, real, <laughs> really part of the fire service. And as it was yeah. out here, on our permanents, we call them permanents in Western Australia, our perms, <laughs> for want of a better nickname, uh, are only based in the major cities. Uh, and so we've got them permanently in, in going from the south, Albany, Bunbury, Mandurah, Perth, Geraldton, I think Caratha and maybe Port Hedland. Now, mm. that's not a lot of area to cover from permanent. So the rest of the, the state... In fact, the West Australian Fire Brigade covers the largest area of land than any other fire service in the world. But it's covered, wow. uh, that it is totally supported by uh, volunteers when, when we go out into the bush. When I say the bush, it's probably 60 miles from Perth, and that's where you need the volunteer. You've got, you've got, then you've got it broken down again. You've got the volunteer bushfire service. And you've got the volunteer fire and rescue. Fire and rescue, the vehicle extrication, structural, all, all the same mm-hmm. things as a normal permanent firefighter would do. Whereas the, the bushfire brigade, they only fight bushfires. They're not trained in BA and structural attack or anything like that. But 
Mm. When the balloon does go up, they all come together and, uh, yeah. In fact, we had a large incident just, what, it had only been four or five miles to the north of us yesterday and wow. that was a, con uh, a conveyor belt fire in a, uh, a fertiliser factory. A factory. Yeah. Right. And so, of course... Oh, fertiliser. That stinks. Yeah. Uh, and being a conveyor belt, uh, so they had 70 permanents turn out, which is just about a level five. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the bushfire brigade followed, uh, and, and the volunteer fire and rescue were there and the bushfire brigade. So they were all backing up as and when required because we're, we're just south of a major industrial complex where we are in, in Western Australia. And that mm. was that's the closest one to us, I think, West Farmers. So yeah. So stupid question. They um, <clears throat> we use terms like volunteer, on call, and stuff like that, and we won't go too far down this rabbit hole because I know it's not the purpose of our of our conversation today. But are they purely volunteer? They don't get paid at all. Do nope. they all get some sort of reimbursement? No, nothing. Isn't that surreal? Like from from your awareness of different countries around the yeah. world, and like the UK as an yeah. example. Why have other countries, maybe we'll use the UK as an example, we do have a lot of great volunteers. There's a lot of great volunteers still everywhere. But people don't necessarily volunteer for something like this. It is a massive... Yeah. Some people say it's a massive imposition. I'd say it's a massive honour. But again, you've got to pay the bills, yeah. blah, blah, blah. You know, it's... Uh, why... What is it about the culture out there that you still get such a strong volunteer sector? Well, when you say a strong volunteer sector, I was just looking at the volunteer numbers in Western Australia over the last five years, and they're on the decline. Okay. Right? They've come down about eight to 10,000 overall in total in the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. But people just like giving to the community here. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's the bottom line. You know, and and you ask them, and they'll go, well, I'm going to get training which can also, I can take those skills with me into my job, into a, a job. Yes, you know, that's a big thing that I think I, employers don't understand as yeah, well, yeah. Uh, the BA, the first aid, all of that is transportable because mm -hmm. now they, they yeah. have to be trained to a certain standard and those standards are transportable to wherever they go. So they people benefit that way and they're appreciative of getting those skills but also helping the local community hmm. there is a uh, there's some really interesting studies and again we won't go much further here but like there's some really interesting when you start to pay someone for something that they did voluntarily anyway it has a real distortion on um, motivation and the value that we attach to things, because yep. again, on the old hierarchy of needs, there's many ways you can you can get social acknowledgement. The fact you're doing something good for the community, yep. you can get that moral uh, good feeling. But because we're so conditioned to a monetary value to stuff, it's like you stamp that on it, yeah. and then that seems to be the only thing it is. Then it's the world of comparison of well, why is why is John getting sixteen dollars and I'm getting fourteen dollars yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it, it can really, really distort it. Um, so the the games has been going, what has it been now? I think it's been 14 the, the, or 15? No, uh, 34 years. Oh, there was, um, <clears throat> yeah, so Vegas got cancelled and we had the COVID one as well. No, we? no, Vegas didn't get cancelled. <clears throat> Vegas went ahead. Uh, then I joined in 94 for Perth. Then we went... No, I was thinking 2014, sorry. Oh, I was getting my count wrong. Yeah. So 2014 got cancelled. Yeah, 2014. And, uh, then we had the and COVID there's, there's, one. There's a yeah. lot of <clears throat> bad history in that. Then in 2015, there was nothing left of the World Firefighter Games. Basically nothing. Oh, wow. Uh, Why? Well, what happened there? Because well, COVID, you know, well, was, wasn't We didn't have games in, in 14 because of mm -hmm. outside dynamics. 16 was nowhere on the horizon because of economics. And yeah. the gentleman who was in charge of it then decided to retire. And I, oh. and you know, there was five or six of us still involved, hoping mm -hmm. that the games would kick off again. And then I, I was nominated as the chief executive officer in 2015 and then 
nothing happened for 16. And then I, I'd come home from work, sitting here, and I got a phone call, and no disrespect. I, I didn't understand the phone call. So they called me back, and it was uh, Korea. And, yeah. And that's where we kicked off again, 2018 in Chengdu. And that. Got a good relationship with them, haven't you? Because you did Daegu yep, in yep, 2010. Yeah. Mate, the Koreans, you, you, you cannot want for a better people. Really? No. I've never been. It looks beautiful. Oh, it is. And the people are beautiful. I know they get a lot of bad rap with North Korea, yeah. but it's a totally different yeah. sort of thing. It's a whole different yeah. politics and nation, really. Yeah. But, you know, South Korea, the, the people are so friendly. And if, if they can't, if they see you on the street and you're lost, they'll come up and try and help you. And if they can't, if they don't speak English and you don't speak Korean, they will in, inadvert, in, invariably call someone who can speak English to translate for them to help you. That's, oh, bless them. That's how amazing that place is. Yeah. You know? It looks, it looks it's absolutely incredible. So we had, um, we had Chungju in 2018. Yep. And then the, the proverbial shit show of the global pandemic. Yep put a kibosh on on everything yep that must have been a really heavy lift to get it back off its feet again as you'd literally just three years earlier worked so hard as a team yeah. to get it back on its feet yeah. again yeah yeah it was oh it was heartbreaking honestly <laughs> you know, yeah. why did you keep going why why did you not just go you know what it's been great let's knock it on the head because i love it it's what i believe in i love going to these games and seeing the firefighters male, female, old and young, having fun and enjoying it and meeting new people, making new friendships and absorbing the local community and its cultures. That's what it's all about. Mm. You know, mm. it's not about me. I just keep pushing through and my wife because that's all I want to see happen is all these firefighters come together one area every two years and – I will admit uh, what was said to me in Korea brought tears to my eyes. I was absolutely, I couldn't speak of what, because mm. of what was said to me. Not nastily, it was just in appreciation. It was just out of this world and it's not what I expected. I didn't, I don't do it for the pats on the back. I do it for the firefighters. And when these people came up and said what they said to me, it was just so moving emotionally. So that that's what keeps me going, you know, knowing that hmm. I'm bringing, well, me, the team, we're bringing in enjoyment to firefighters. Hmm. After, you know, they have all the stresses of work, not only work, hmm. but home life and all that. And then once every two years, hopefully... They can go there and let off steam. Yeah, you know. Now there's um there's so much that gets covered uh, across this for people that are. I always have to pull us out of uh, the rabbit holes or like the the closed conversations sometimes because I have to be cognizant of the fact that there'll be people who have never heard of the World Firefighter Games. Um, there will be people in the brand new starting in their career. This is what's something very unique about the UK at the minute. We've got so many new people yeah. coming into the services real fit healthy really active people we've seen tremendous growth with a lot of the challenges that myself and, and john gregory are involved in obviously yep. well john john organizes the british and then we've seen the welsh and the cheshire and there's the stuff sprouting up scotland want to do their own thing there's yep. there's loads sprouting up all over the place the world firefighter games does have a lot of the traditional uh combat challenges toughest firefighter alive challenge type model that people would have seen but the unique thing about this that people won't know because there's some people that want to get involved in stuff like this but they maybe don't have an appetite for the specific firefighter challenge stuff you guys and girls cover like loads i think how many events we've do got you 40 have? There's, events. There's 40 events and i mean these are i'm looking at the list now so i'm, I'm not going to waste everyone's time leading all of them but literally stuff that everyone would reckon oh, badminton basketball archery Arm wrestling, Jesus Christ! You've got arm wrestling, um, billiards, bodybuilding, cross country, cycling, darts, um, firehouse cook off, judo, karate, marathons, pool, 
rowing. Man, I might do the rowing. I'll tell you what, I've really been getting really good at rowing lately, just by accident, um, doing a lot of CrossFit stuff. Um, water rescue, water polo, windsurfing, triathlons, and then again, the, the staples of your toughest firefighter alive. And Oh, mate, table tennis. Jesus, you've got tabs in it. Jesus, table tennis is like the biggest sport on fire stations. In other news, this episode is brought to you in partnership with MSA Safety. Today, we have them to thank for the improved firefighter safety through connectivity in their brand new connected firefighter system. At the center of the connected firefighter platform is the MSA M1 SCBA with telemetry. You can view battery life, air pressure, and estimated time remaining either independently on the M1 itself or from the lunar connected device screen. Also, still with the air status alarm information, search status, and all of this provided to the incident command for confident decision making during the scene. That integrates straight in with the lunar system, which is a wireless all-in-one device creating an independent search and rescue network, providing edge detection, enhanced personal thermal imaging, while simplifying post-scene reporting and data retention. One of the key parts of the Luna is their FAST system, the Firefighting Assisting Search Technology. This combines directional and distance information with thermal imaging to help find separated teammates and decrease response time. It actually connects you to the other crews in the vicinity for a unified search during the time of mutual aid by instantly notifying the network of lunar devices when there is a downed crew member, allowing for a prompt search and rescue. All of this then plugs into the FireGrid system for cloud-based connectivity, real-time information, and data-driven decisions for the incident commander. It enables you to see the exact location of your firefighters on the scene. And it doesn't require you to be sat on the station. The MSA hub then provides a wireless gateway straight to the cloud, enabling wireless on-scene data for local and remote incident command for additional eyes on the scene. MSA are truly taking massive strides in the future of improved firefighter safety through connectivity. MSA is dedicated to increasing safety in the fire service through technological advancements. Various feature enhancements, new products, partnerships, and integrations will provide additional capabilities readily accessible by products, software, and services in the brand new MSA Connected Firefighter platform. Now back to the show. You can take your your children there, and if they're over 18, they're also allowed to compete. Oh, really? Yeah. That's that's why. incredible. I said it at Chengju that we're the inclusive games. Wives, children over 18, just for insurance things, can compete. We also, But we also have one for the whole family, which I'm pretty sure they're going to run it, is a treasure hunt. So if you've got little kids in there, you can take your kids. Kids can come along with mum and dad on the treasure hunt just to involve everyone in the games. Man, that's awesome. How big is the organisation? Because I say there's 40 plus events that it really is. It's like an Olympics because yeah. the facilities, the resources, yeah. the amount of venues. Even as I'm just looking down the list, there you've got you've got multiple sports of you know things like rugby and stuff like this that require. They're big. That's a big thing to organise. A rugby tournament on its own would yeah. be a massive thing to organise, and that is just one of forty massive things <laughs> that yeah. you've got going on. The the whole city uh, gets uh, are awarded the games. And then okay. they go to the local community, you know, like the rugby club, mm-hmm. the soccer club, football club, uh, tennis club, swimming club, and all these, and ask them, bring them in to be involved. So that they, they, they're also expanding it to the wide, utilizing the wider community. Yeah. Uh, but still coordinating it. Which is probably really great for all their local economy as well, you know, gets yeah. all the sports clubs involved. Yep. Gets the social aspect of it. Yep. It really is like a, a, a city festival style uh, whole is. thing, isn't it? Because I bet yeah. we, the whole all these nations just descend on this place, like an Olympics. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I bet it's incredible. It's a, it is a type of a form of mini Olympics for firefighters with a few five five specific events, mm-hmm. and. Uh, we also allow the, the country, the, the hosting company, country, to be able to include up to four events of like national uh, type. So if you was in Scotland, if it's Scotland, say Glasgow held it, they could have toss in the caber if they liked. They could add that. Oh in. wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be so cool. it allows them a little bit to show off the their own culture as far as sports mm. go. So when you're looking at putting these sorts of things together, like you say, you get the, the host nations on board. How do people actually 
apply for it how do they get their teams together and how early do you start advertising this sort of stuff because i know we're talking about 2024 now um this is still it's still available for people to put in for it isn't it so it's still people can still continue to put teams and everything i mean it's september yeah um, yeah but, so it's it's it, it'll it's be tomorrow to, almost really it's up to the host country to decide when they're going to close the Entries, the uh, registration right. I, I would suggest to people get your registrations in early because they are saying that some of the events are close to being full. You know, like I think golf, that's nearly full. The TFA, that's golf. about 60%. Jesus Christ. Uh, you, golf is like Marmite, isn't it, I suppose? Some people, abs, I've just never, it's never clicked for me. Nah. But golf is it's one of the most participated sports in, in the world, I think. It's, it's huge absolutely colossal but it's just it was never my thing but more people die playing golf than any other sport in the world so i'm staying away what? yeah <laughs> didn't you well, know they that? get eaten by a crocodile on the course or something or get hit no, in the head well, with a ball i don't know they're all a lot of them are age people and they go on the court and <laughs> yeah i suppose so the 80 year old having a heart yeah. attack on the 16th green yeah and they tie that to golf. I love it. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, people can still register for this. Do you know how it works with sporting leave and things like that? What's the common, again, you can't speak on behalf of every freaking nation in the world, but with from your experiences, how do people go about getting support from their teams, from their services, from their nations? Is there any advice you have for how people could navigate that conversation with their well, services? It, what do you see usually work? If they... A lot of fire services do support. It depends on the financial or the economics of the country that they're living in for national support, local support. Uh, I won't offer an individual invitation. Like I won't send Pete Wakefield a, a specific invitation to come to the World Firefighter Games. I will mention Pete Wakefield and any of his colleagues who would like to attend to the World yeah. Firefighter Games, could you help them? That sort of thing. So it's a generalised, so it's not mm -hmm. just for the one person. Yeah. Uh, and I've done that on several occasions. Whether it's worked mm -hmm. for them or not, I don't know. I, I sent one to Gibraltar uh, a few weeks ago for G the Gibraltans to attend. And I Who think was that? Was that Matt? You know, who is it who reached out to you? So Gibraltar, I've got some really fit boys and girls in their fire and rescue service. And uh, yeah, is, Matt is, and a few is, members of the team is one regularly of your blokes, go to stuff like this. The Firefighter Challenge. I can't remember his... Yeah, Matt, I think his yeah. name is. Yeah, it'd probably be Matt. Well, there's a couple of them that go around the world doing doing the, the events. Yeah. But uh, I think we've got a couple going over from the UK this year as well. Me and John are uh, still having the conversations about how we can try and get there. Because we're all going out to... Um, this might come... No, in fact, we'll put this out before we go away because we'll all be out in Saudi soon as well. So talk to me about the sort of stuff that you do helping and supporting other organisations and uh, because you're kind of like a wartime general with this now, planning these massive events. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't do it that way. If someone wants advice and I, and I have the knowledge to be able to pass that on, I'm more than happy to do it. Hmm. You know, I'm I'm not going to step in and take over someone else's event. They want to organise no. it, not a problem. I'll give them advice or pointers, but don't don't ask me to come and run run your event. And thank no. thankfully, no one has, because mm -hmm. maybe they think I'm not good enough. So that's good. Keep thinking that way. <laughs> no, mate. But, I, so when we get invited to so much stuff now, I learning to say no in a polite way, is actually a very important skill set, isn't it? When yeah. people people want you to do stuff, they want, and you can just become a busy fool being crap or half good at a yeah. lot of things. Um, yeah, learning to say, look, if you want me to attend, this is what I'm going to do. This is the value that I think I'm going to add, um, but I'm not going to do that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to organize it. I'm not going to organize accommodation. I'm not going to do logistics. I'm not going to do it. I'll turn up. Yeah. I'll host it or whatever, and I'll support it and advertise it and compete. Or give or whatever. them contacts, you know. This, yeah, this or give you contacts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not going to do the thing. No, no, <laughs> not at all. 
Today's podcast is powered by our partner Lifelines and their revolutionary approach to functional hydration. Just like in firefighting, water is essential for body function, but studies show more than 80% of firefighters are dehydrated. A 25-year study findings from the National Institute of Health showed poor hydration to be linked to early aging and chronic disease and even mild dehydration results in significant negative impact outcomes including headaches, exhaustion, rapid pulse, irritability and poor cognitive function. A study conducted by Yale University showed that participants who were just 1% dehydrated had a 12% increase in errors when performing tasks that required cognitive flexibility. In addition, dehydration is shown to worsen mood and attitude, contribute to confusion and poor decision making, and negatively affect memory and judgment. In other words, you really don't want your internet commander, firefighter, or for that matter any first responder on a critical scene to be even slightly dehydrated. Mild dehydration occurs when a person is just 1.5% dehydrated, a condition that does not even trigger the thirst response in most people. So just imagine how quickly a firefighter or any first responder can and does become dehydrated in their day-to-day duties, which is why I address my hydration first thing every day with Lifelines. Go into the notes for this episode and specifically check out Lifelines Hydro Fuel and Hydro OG by clicking in the notes for the podcast for a clean energy solution designed for those who demand more from their day. Now back to the show. So when we look at the um, the events coming around for this year, is there any that you have a particular fondness for? Is there any that you have as favourites? Are there any returning athletes or things that you think would be worth people looking out for um, for September? Oh, well, there's so many. You know, my wife calls them her sons. She goes there and, and there's so many firefighters from around the world that we've met. And uh, yeah. I, I just love seeing them all again. It's just just great to see that they're coming back and that they're still healthy and safe. It's a family. Whether yeah. whether people want to say it's not, well, I, I'm sorry, but I will say it's a family. And I will do 100%. my best to make everyone happy at those games. Hmm. If there's an, but if you said to meet firefighters from all over the world, uh, they're pretty much all the same. You know, the the culture, the nation, the language might be different, but there's something about uh, kind of like the moral compass of the individual, the type of you kind of know the type of person yep. that they are. Yeah, you know, they're uh, get shit done, helping out. You can leave your bags with them. You could leave your yep. kids with them. They're good people usually. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Ninety nine percent are just We've all, People we've all that got are the strong, same strong moral fiber. Yeah, we've all got the same thing in common, mm. and, and to do that job, you need the strong moral fiber. Mm. You know, because mm-hmm. it at the end of the day, it's teamwork, and you've got to be mm. able to trust your team members. Mm. You know, no matter what you do, and and you go there, so everyone is used to being a team. So we're we've gone from. A, four, a five-man fog attack team to mm-hmm. a 5,000 well, firefighter games team. Jesus. <laughs> it's massive, yeah. It's you know, such a behemoth so, for you yeah. guys to be organising. So so when we're looking at uh, coming out this year, um, for people that want to find out more information about it, what is the best place for them to go to? What's the best place for people to get in contact? Because again, it will be here before we know it. You know, It will absolutely race around in September of this year um so for people to get themselves boxed off and organized and certainly start sorting out teams again because you look at the buffet of stuff that's on that's on offer yeah it's uh it's just huge well it's uh www.wfg2024.dk is the website we will stick that in the notes for people to, to go and have a look at. Uh, I know we're on a time cap this morning. I want to be respectful of your time. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to get some proper time together when we're out in Saudi. We'll, uh, yeah. we'll get some food and some drinks together. It'll be cool. Yeah. Um, is there anything that we want to cover before we head off? Is there anyone we've forgotten to mention? Is there anyone, is there anything that we want to, uh, you want to sort of leave in the minds of listeners before we head off? Well, I, I just want to leave in the mind of the listeners that come to Olberg for a great time. It's a great party city, and you'll be able to compete, meet, and eat to your heart's content. 
that last one is 100% on my but I'm, I'm not drinking 17 years but I can eat like I'm still 24 stone <laughs> yeah. so I used to be massive and, <laughs> and I'm heading out to Saudi everyone's talking about the post-competition food that seems to be some of the biggest conversation that's yeah. going on in the WhatsApp what everyone's going to be eating and smashing when we finish but uh, beautiful well look, I thought forward to seeing you out there in a few weeks brother and then uh, hopefully making some plans together for the games this year no worries Pete take care mate Cheers, in the meantime stay safe The Firefighters Podcast was created to recognize, acknowledge, inspire, and hopefully even motivate these incredible individuals who have chosen to be part of the first responder community. Our driving purpose is to create a legacy resource for the current and future generations of firefighters and first responders. We get some incredible feedback from listeners and guests. And as the podcast grows, our desire to create longevity and sustainability means that we are asking for the support of our listeners. If you want to support the podcast, if you want to get discounts to our merchandise, hoodies, clothing, coins, patches, talent and also access to all of the incredible documents get shared with us from our podcast guests and sector leaders and please head over to our patreon page and for just three pound a month you can support the future of the podcast please finally hit that follow subscribe or rate button on the platform you're listening and wherever you're on the world please support your emergency services responders and thank you for listening